I, on my personal behalf and behalf of Vigyan Bharti, extend a warm and cordial welcome to one and all. And today we have a very interesting topic, yet another topic on the series of Swatantrata, Sangram and Vigyan. Knowledge is never the exclusive possession of any particular race, nor does it recognize geographical limitations. The whole world is interdependent and a constant stream of thought had been carried out throughout the ages, enriching the common heritages, heritage of mankind. Such were the words of Acharya Jagdish Chandra Basu when he was addressing Banaras Hindu University in the year 1916 and which had come out in the book form exactly 100 years back in the year 1921. Acharya Basu is perhaps one of the best polymath that our country Bharat has produced, excelling in more than one domain. We, we, we all know him for his work on the Criscograph, uh, that is plant uh, botany, as well as the discovery uh, of microwaves, the propagation of microwaves. We are indeed glad that we have with us today Professor Shivaji Raha, to, who is a former director of the Temple of Learning, in the words of Basu, the former director of Bose Institute, to speak to us on, the, on this topic, Acharya Jagdish Chandra Basu, his life, his work, and his times. And we are indeed fortunate also to have with us Professor Dinesh, uh, who is the vice chancellor, current vice chancellor of JC Bose University of Science and Technology, Faridabad. I extend a warm welcome to one and all. Uh, may I uh, now request my co-host, Dr. Rajiv Singh, to formally introduce the speaker. And before he does that, I have an uh, information that uh, the questions will be taken by the speaker at the end of his talk. And those of you desirous of asking, please type those questions in the YouTube. And we may get, uh, we also will say circulate a form, a feedback form to you for you for you to fill in. May I now request Dr. Raji to formally introduce the speaker. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ramanathanji. Respected Professor Dinesh Kumar, Vice Chancellor, Jagdish Chandra Bose University of Science and Technology, Faridabad. Respected Professor Dinesh former director, Bose Institute College. And my colleague, Dr. Ramanathanji. And we also have Mane Jain Sasmudhiji National Organizing Secretary Gyan Bharati, Mantras, and Dr. Ranjan Garwal, convener of the program. Our audiences who have joined us through various social channels like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, students and academicians from various institutions across India, and our respected groups from the country. To foundation is based on Swadeshi science movement. It is a big organization of eminent scientists, academicians, students, and general public. One of the aim of Vigyan Bharati is to Swadeshi movement in this age of modern technology for the purpose of national construction. We have a continuous mission to reach the process
डॉक्टर राजीव आपकी आवाज ठीक नहीं आ रही है हेलो कुछ बेटर है पहले से यस इट्स इट्स वी आर हैविंग अ हैवी रेन आउटसाइड एंड सो आई जूम द वाईफाई कनेक्शन डॉक्टर रामानाथन कैन यू टेक इट अप एंड देन यू यू डू द जॉब और समवन हु इज हैविंग गुड कनेक्टिविटी Okay, so uh, because of poor connectivity that Dr. Rajiv Singh is facing, let me do the honors of uh, introducing the speaker. We have with us, as I told, Professor Shivaji Raha, one of the former directors, uh, the former director of Basu Institute, or what is anglicized as Bose Institute. Uh, he born in 1954 from Calcutta, had his education in the University of Calcutta. for his undergraduates and went ahead to university delaware to do his masters of science and finally his doctor of philosophy at university of texas most of 40 years back he has been a research scientist uh, of high energy physics at philips university marburg germany and uh, from research officer to lecturer in saha institute of nuclear physics at in calcutta and he has been a research professor Uh, physics, uh, science, and nuclear physics, and of particle physics, at University of Virginia in Char Charlottesville. He has been a reader of uh, physics at the uh, Bose Institute and professor since uh, 1997. Uh, he has had several uh, prestigious positions at the national and invited positions at the international level. Uh, he has visited uh, various departments of. the universities of international repute some of them includes the university of sao paulo brazil a senior guest scientist at the international center of theoretical physics trieste italy so on and so forth uh, he has been listed as a noteworthy physicist researcher educator by marquis huzu and he's a life member and has been a vice president uh, of indian physical society and indian physics association with this brief introduction Uh, may i now request professor shivaji raha to talk to us about acharya jagdish chandra basu his life and his times and his works over to you professor raha thank you very much it's a real pleasure for me to speak at this forum and especially on this speech which is the amrit mahotsav for tantrata the uh, dam and uh, the platinum jubilee of our independence for uh, coming up in a few couple of, uh, next year and it's a beautiful theme the swatantrata and science and india's role in that uh, arena and there could be no other uh, example apt for this occasion rather than acharya jagdish chandra bose it's something of a, a little known fact that jagdish chandra bose was in fact the first freedom fighter in the non violent uh mode if we call the sepoy mutiny of 1857 as the first war of independence uh from the british rule 
Then Jagdish Chandra Bose, who was born just a year later in Kolkata, carried out the first non-violent protest against British misrule, which he won. I will come to that story in due course. But the, as the title says, the theme of this talk is his life, his works, and, and in order to do justice to any of these three sub-items, one would really need to talk for long. And in any public lecture, such time cannot be allotted in one sitting. So I would really scheme through many of these uh, items just to give the readers a glimpse of this multifaceted personality, this true polymath. And I would try to impress upon you that the life he lived, the work he did, and the teachings he left us more than a hundred years ago continue to be extremely relevant even today. So without further ado, the topic. Next slide, please. Yeah, this shows his early life, picture of his uh, uh, parents who gave him an early education and bringing up, which helped him keep his feet on the ground all through his life. This is a picture of the St. Xavier's College uh, School, where he had his early uh, education in Kolkata from where he got a bachelor's degree. This is a picture of Father Lafont, a Belgian priest and a professor at St. Xavier's College, from him, whom Jesse Bose got the initial uh, initiation in the study of natural sciences. Physics, as you know, is used to be called and is still called in many quarters, the natural philosophy. And therefore, it was Father Lafont who initiated him in study of uh, physics. Uh, this is a picture of his wife, Lady Abola Bose, who Jesse Bose married in 1987, and who has been who had been his main inspiration through his entire life. They were uh, issueless. Uh, history tells us that they had one daughter who died in her infancy. And after that, they never had any other children. So their life was dedicated to science and society. Next, please. These are snippets of his studies in England. After get, getting his BA degree in, in, from Calcutta University, he went to England, like most well-to-do uh, children from uh, sons from well-to-do families used to in those days. And he went there to read medicine. But unfortunately, during his early life in India, he had contracted Kalazar, which flared up in the cold weather of uh, England and rendered him unable or unfit to read uh, medicine, the rigor, withstand the rigors of study of and then he shifted to Cambridge to read tripos in the natural sciences, namely physics, chemistry, and botany. And there he had the association of extremely important and relevant uh, people at that time, like Sidney Vines, uh, Lord Kelvin, and 
many other storms in the area of physics and biology. So he got his uh, tripos degree in 1884 and simultaneously also a Bachelor of Arts BA from the University College London. Next, please. Before I get into this scientific history and uh, explore J.C. Bose's role, I would like to mention that in, after getting his uh, tripos and BA degrees in England, he returned to Kolkata and with a very strong recommendation from a family friend, William Fawcett, who was the postmaster general of uh, India and uh, later the British Empire at the time, with his strong recommendation, he came to the Viceroy. The Viceroy recommended that he get a professorship at Presidency College. The professorship that was available at the time was a full professor. And in those days, there were two kinds of positions. One was a professor, the service of the first kind, which was de facto reserved for Europeans. And the other was so-called the provisional uh, education service, where Indians could be accommodated if found suitable. J.C. Bose certainly was much more qualified than most of the European professors in employment at that time. But the DPI at that time wasn't willing to accommodate J.C. Bose in the, uh, uh, the first class service. So he was appointed in the provincial service and that too on a temporary basis so that he had the salary of a half a professor. So effectively, he was uh, sanctioned one third the salary of a full professor at that time. It was totally unacceptable to J.C. Bose, naturally. And he refused to accept the salary. But he continued to teach his classes at Presidency College, take off, and involved himself in other administrative duties of the, uh, in the college to him. But he would not accept a penny unless he was paid the full salary. And this went on for three years. After three years, finally, the government of Bengal relented and he was appointed in the full professor's rank. So this is what I mentioned as an anecdote for his first nonviolent peaceful protest which he won. Accepted injustice, but not in a verbal manner, not in a manifestly uh, vehement uh, uh, process, but he would stand for the rights and the ethics in his entire life. Towards the end of this discourse, I will try to give some examples of how he brought that about and what kind of teachings he already mentioned, uh, he already put on record through his entire life. So now to come back to his works, his scientific works, this is a brief background, how the state of physics was at the time when J.C. Bose came into it. The landmark event was around the year 1860, when James Clark Maxwell read a memoir before the Royal Society. Any student of physics now 
knows about the Maxwell's equations on the basis of which we know that electricity and magnetism are uh, forms of the same kind of interaction. And as a result of which we now have the unified picture of kinds of fundamental interactions in science, in physics. So this set of equations, Maxwell's equations, which remain the uh, backbone of the field theory, which is uh, uh, the theory in vogue today. And Maxwell's equations introduced uh, the scalar and vector potentials and the Coulomb gauge are all there. And this is the starting point of our understanding of physics, modern physics in some sense. Definitely, when this was uh, proposed in 1864, the contemporaries, the, the practitioners of that time, found the formulation extremely difficult to follow. Next, please. And before the theory could be experimentally verified, Maxwell died. Experiments were not done in earnest at the time. Many tried to construct mathematical models, hoping to rid the formulation of the troublesome abstractness. Okay. Maxwell, Thomson, Curry, Fitzgerald, Helmholtz, and many others worked at it feverishly. This was essentially the holy grail of theoretical physics at that time. Next, please. But at that time, there were also a few who tried to understand the basis and the implications of the Maxwell's equation through observation and experiments. So Fitzgerald, in 1883, suggested that by creating a disturbance uh, in the ether, which was believed to be the medium through which electricity percolated and uh, progressed uh, in those days. So by creating an electrical disturbance, maybe the waves that were considered to be the uh, outcome of the Maxwell's equation could be uh, generated. So several scientists, leading scientists of that time, started experimenting in those areas. Next, please. And soon, a German scientist called Hertz, Heinrich Hertz, he showed that by discharging the output of a spark gap generator into a dipole antenna, one could show that in a accompanying uh, uh, in a uh, nearby air gap okay, between a wear loop, you could generate sparks. Okay. So since there was no such, no coil taking, uh, connecting this gap to the Rumford coil, so this must have been propagated through means of a wave. Okay. So this is what was called the Hertzian wave because the wave was discovered by Hertz. And this was a 66 centimeter wave, wavelength wave. And it showed that this wave traveled with the speed of light and it could be shown to diffract. Then we're using a slit and show that they are linearly polarized. If these could all be established experimentally, then Maxwell's predictions, Maxwell's equations would be vindicated. Because Maxwell's equation showed that the electromagnetic wave 
or the Hertzian wave, that would be the outcome of his equations, would have the properties of light, the light wave. Next, please. So there were many, many leading experts at the time, Lodge, Rigi, Popov, Fleming, and others, to carry out Hertz's work forward. Okay. And the way to detect these waves, many detectors were uh, fashioned. Okay. For example, a mass of iron filings okay, held together in a case would serve them as a detector of the electrical waves. Because when this electric wave passes, there would be a magnet, magnetic field associated with it according to Maxwell's equations. And as a result, the iron filings would react to the passage of this magnetic field. And Rigi, this Italian physicist, he was Marconi's mentor. Okay. This may become relevant uh, at some point later. Okay. If we have time towards the end, we might uh, mention one anecdote. Now, 1894, Hertz died. Uh, until then, he was very active in this research, but he had also built up the school who were all feverishly pursuing these activities. Next, please. Jesse Bose, Presidency College in 1885, as I already mentioned. For eight or nine years, he was first, as I mentioned, he was uh, busy with his struggle in establishing the rights of an Indian professor who's suitably qualified. Then he was teaching a full load of courses. So there is no record that he ever did any serious research. But even though there is no record, it's fair to conclude that he must have kept himself involved and informed about the kind of work that was going on uh, in the world through his contacts in Cambridge, which he had maintained, I'm sure he kept himself abreast of what was happening in the field of electromagnetic research. Now, on 30th November 1895, his 36th birth anniversary, there was an entry diary. And there he writes that he has decided that his service to the motherland would be through the pursuit of scientific research and knowledge. One can only conclude that through his preparation and preparation of these eight, after these eight years, he felt confident that he would be able to make a mark in this field. And lo and behold, that's precisely what happened. In six months' time, he reported a monumental discovery. Okay. So in 1894, he sets up a small laboratory in Presidency College, which was next to a small bathroom. He converted that space into a laboratory. And he started setting, started working on generating these Hertzian waves. Size. Why manageable size? Because as I mentioned to you, Hertz had succeeded in a wave whose wavelength was 66 centimeters. Now, if one is to show that such long waves is of light waves, then to reflect them, to, ref to disperse them through prisms, one would need lenses and prisms which are the size of a room. And that would make these waves 
uh, open to all kinds of distortion and none of the conclusions would be tenable. So the challenge was to produce a small manageable wave. And that's precisely what Jesse Booth succeeded in doing. He reported the production of what he called microwave then, but today uh, it's not, a, it's a microwave in the sense that it's very small, but it's of millimeter uh, wavelength. So what he succeeded was in producing a five millimeter wave, uh, millimeter wavelength wave. Next, please. And so therefore, he could perform his experiments with moderate size crystals. Next, please. These are pictures of the devices that he used to produce this kind of small wave. The implications, uh, I'm not going to uh, spend too much time in details of these but they will be part of this presentation. And if anybody is interested in learning more about them, please feel free to contact me through email and I would be happy to talk about them. Next, please. Now, I mentioned that this box containing iron file, uh, filings used to serve as the detector uh, for uh, earlier uh, investing. Bose's primary achievement in this was the discovery of a new detector, which is called, was he called the spiral spring coherer. Okay. And the advantage of that was that this did not die after each detection. Earlier, because of the iron filings, if you think about it, you can immediately realize that every time this earlier detector of iron filings would experience a magnetic field, the iron filings will get oriented according to them. So until you erase that memory and bring them back to the earlier con random configuration, the detector would not have been ready for fresh measurement. This was, this problem was avoided by J.C. Bose and what he had discovered is now we call today a multi-contact semiconductor. Next, please. This is a diagram of the spiral finger receiver. Next. Yeah, once again, this is the diagram of the polarization apparatus. I don't want to discuss this in detail. This showed the uh, double diffraction and uh, the polarizability property of uh, uh, the uh, double diffraction properties and total internal reflection of the Hertzian wave. Next, please. Yeah, this again is an example of J.C. Bose's homemade detectors, which produced enormous accuracy. This is a train timetable called the Bradshaw with metals interleaved in between. And this acted as a polarizer okay? so that light was allowed to pass through it in one direction, but not in the other direction, the property of a polarizer. Okay? Now, this was entirely homemade. And this has this will show up to be the hallmark of J.C. Bose's unique characteristic through his entire life. He made extremely sophisticated and sensitive equipments through his own design out of the materials locally available, and he got them made with the help of the local artisans. And this essentially started the tradition of sophisticated yet 
uh, affordable vision in India, which has been the hallmark of Indian science for since then. Next, please. Yeah, this is again a twisted jute polarizer. Next. Yeah. So 84, 1894-95 at Presidency College, Kolkata, and then after all, uh, afterwards at the Town Hall, Kolkata, Bose demonstrated that his electric rays can travel through air, wood, stone walls, and human body, and up to a distance of 75 feet. Note that this was done without the aid of anywhere. So this was the very, excuse me, first demonstration of transmission without wares. And Essentially, the day of wireless transmission was born. Note the date. This was 1895, two years before Marconi's first demonstration of wireless transmission. As an aside, I can tell you right now that there was always a controversy of whether Marconi discovered wireless transmission or J.C. Bose. And Marconi, as you know, got the Nobel Prize for it. But J.C. Bose, during his lifetime, was ever asked whether he felt deprived of the due honor for the discovery of wireless transmission. His answer was, it's not important who gets the honor as long as the discovery is made and it's used for uh, human society. What I can also tell you is again a historical anecdote. In 19, uh, in uh, 2007, when Bose Institutes was celebrating its uh, foundation day on the birthday of J.S.C. Bose, 30th November. There was an unannounced visitor to Bose Institute because on that day, the Institute uh, observes an open house. And this gentleman came in, visited the Museum of Bose Institute and looked at the archival history and in the visitor's book wrote down that having been here and seen the records, I am now convinced that Sir J.C. Bose had done the experiment on wireless transmission substantially before that by my grandfather, Giebu Marconi, and signed Giuseppe Pacese Marconi, okay, who himself is, a, uh, is an astronomer of substantial standing. OK. So with that bit of story uh, aside, and OK, maybe you could also mention another episode. There was a lot of letters exchanged between J.C. Bose and the other stalwart of Bengal and India, Rabindranath Thakur. And during that time, there was a letter particularly one uh, specific letter where J.C. Bose narrated to Rabindranath 
the story of his demonstration of the wireless transmission in the Royal Institution. And he said that there were a lot of pressures on uh, him from various uh, people in England at the time who said that please don't reveal all this uh, discovery, all of the discovery, because we would like to take a patent in your name. There is money, unimaginable amount of money in this. And Jesse Bo said that uh, he did not want to listen to them, but he tried to demonstrate uh, the tra wireless transmission in his lecture. And afterwards, there was such enthusiasm and people rushed to the table to uh, touch the equipment and see how it worked, that in that melee, his handwritten notes disappeared from his table. Okay. And the story goes, that in that uh, in those notes there were designs of the so-called horn and antenna that JC Bose had designed, and noticeably, those designs are valid even today. They are widely used in millimeter wave astronomy. Okay. Uh, so. These horn antenna designs, Jesse will suffer for that because uh, he had himself designed them. So the notes valuable to him. But what happened was that when Marconi did his experiments, successful experiments ultimately, he had also used the same kind of detectors fashioned after the horn antenna. Until then, he had only been using the uh, iron filing detectors. So when Marconi was asked that how did he come in to get the idea of the horn antenna detector, he first said that Rigi had suggested it to him Rigi denied that. Rigi said he had no idea about the horn antenna. And there was a suspicion that somehow those notes, uh, these uh, notes which had disappeared, were the source of that information. Be that as it may, Jesse Bose never really worried about it. And for him, the value of the discovery was much more than uh, the commercial application. But there is also another side to the story, which will come to very soon. Next, please. Yeah, so this is a picture of Jesse Bose lecturing at Royal Institution, demonstrating his wireless transmission of signals. Next. Next. Yeah. During the trips of JC Bowes, okay, before I uh, get to this slide, I should mention that on the strength of this demonstration, JC Bowes was awarded the DSC degree of the University of London in 1896. And then after two years, he was also invited by Cambridge and uh, other laboratories to come and take his work further there. And with the strong recommendation of the scientists there, namely Lord Kelvin, the British government of India had to give him leave with the study leave as we call it today. And uh, he went around uh, lecturing there and doing work. He had to come back again because Lee was again denied. And then he wanted to take some more time and complete the work. So for which he first uh, got leave and then uh, essentially had to be, uh, had to take 
live without pay. Okay. So during these times in uh, uh, the year two, uh, 1900, he was lecturing in Paris at the uh, International Congress of Science and Religion. And Swami Vivekananda was there during that time. So he also attended some of these sessions. And what he wrote about his experience comes next. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can read this. This is uh, from uh, the complete works of Swami Vivekananda, volume 7, pages 279 to 279 to 280. Uh, it says, this year, Paris is a center of the civilized world, for it is the year of the Paris exhibition. And there has been an assemblage of eminent men and women from all quarters of the globe. The masterminds of all countries have met today in Paris to spread the glory of their respective countries by means of their genius. The fortunate man whose name, the bells of this uh, great center will ring today will at the same time crown the country also with glory before the world. And where art thou, my motherland, Bengal, in the great capital city, sustaining with, swarming with German, French, English, Italian, and other scholars? Who is there to proclaim thy existence from among that wide galaxy of geniuses? There stepped forth one distinguished youthful hero to proclaim the name of our motherland, Bengal. It was the world famous scientist, Dr. J.C. Bose. Alone, the youthful Bengali physicist with galvanic quickness charmed the Western audience today with his splendid genius, that electric charge infused pulsations of new life into the half-dead body of the motherland. At the top of all physicists today is Jagadish Chandra Bose, an Indian, a Bengali. Well done, hero. And as we all know, Swami Vivekananda was not given to exaggeration, but at the same time, his adoration of true genius knew no bounds. So this is the apt eulogy, yeah, the evaluation of J.C. Bowles and his science and tinged with pride for the country. But this adoration and this admiration that uh, Vivekananda felt had its long and important significance in the later development of Jesse Bose's life and works. Next, please. This is a picture of Sister Nivedita, Miss Margaret Noble, who was Vivekananda's disciple. In fact, she had met Vivekananda before she came to India, and it was effectively through the influence of Vivekananda that she came to India and dedicated herself to India. That's why the name Nivedita. When Sister Nivedita first came she, uh, as Margaret Noble first came to India, she visited the laboratory of J.C. Bose in Presidency College okay. and struck an immediate rapport with J.C. Bose and his wife, Lady Abola. 
In fact, when Nivedita died a premature death in 1911, it was in the arms of Lady Ovala that she breathed her last. So they were lifelong friends and Nivedita's contribution to India, India's freedom fight, India, education in India, all of these deserve a much deeper and much more elaborate uh, discourse than can be, we can afford today. But suffice it to say that Nivedita's influence on Jesse Bose's scientific work, as well as his writings and his later life are enormous and incomparable. Next, please. This is another uh, lady whose influence on J.C. Bose was enormous. She also is a was a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, Sarah Chapman Bull, okay, the wife of the celebrated pianist, a violinist, uh, uh, Oli Bull, okay, independently wealthy. And through, because of uh, her association with Nivedita and uh, Vivekananda, Sarah Chapman Bull also became a huge benefactor of Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose and had enormous contributions to the founding of Bose Institute subsequently. Next, please. Under the prodding and urging of Sister Nivedita and Sarah Chapman Bull, J.C. Bose was persuaded to patent part of his finding, scientific discoveries. And one can only guess that he probably finally agreed to it first at the behest of uh, Swami Vivekananda through Nivedita and Bull, but also at having lost the credit to Marconi, okay, he could be, he probably would have felt the need to put his claim on record. And he filed an application for an US patent called the Detector for Electrical Disturbances. This is a patent which he applied for in 1899, which was finally granted in 2000, now, 1904. Okay. But interestingly, even though he got the patent granted, he did not bother to renew it. And recall his letter to Rabindranath, where he had said that there was uh, this pressure from the British uh, uh, industrialists and uh, British merchants who wanted to take out the patent in his name. Okay? And he had reacted that he did not want to chase after money. Okay? So even if this patent was granted to him, he did not renew it and let it lapse at the first opportunity. Later on, he said that patents should not be the goal of scientists' inventions or uh, discoveries. The fruits of science should be available to entire mankind. That may not be the philosophy that is practiced today, but the nobility and the sincerity behind the pursuit of science as practiced by J.C. Bose simply cannot be denied or doubted. Next, please. Yes, there is an interesting story associated with this uh, picture. This is a picture of a check which was not cashed. And 
This is a check written by J.C. Bose in the sum of 80 pounds. Uh, written to Sarah Chapman Bull. And Sarah Chapman Bull was the person in whose name the patent was applied for. So she had paid the patent filing fees. J.C. Bowes wanted to reimburse her for that. And Sarah Chapman Bull endorsed it back to Lady Ovala Bowes. So this check we finally discovered in the archives of uh, in J.C. Bowes' papers, okay, uh, which was never cashed. Okay. Next. For those of you who can read Bengali, this is a writing from Rabindranath Tagore, where he writes that during his during the time of J.C. Bose's struggles in science and his efforts in uh, recording uh, as publications all his scientific discoveries, he had uh, been greatly helped by Sister Nivedita. And in the annals of J.C. Bose's life, this great lady deserves very special and honorable mention. Next, please. Yes, so to come back to the chronology, from 1894 to 1899, J.C. Bose's research was uh, highlighted by the discovery, uh, the creation of these smallest possible uh, electromagnetic waves and verification of their quasi-optical properties. And 1899 to 1902, the discovery of the study of the properties of the coherers leading to the discovery of similarity in response between the living and the non-living. Okay. And in this course, it may also be mentioned that uh, recall the uh, detector for electrical disturbances uh, for uh, which he had applied for the patent. One of the materials used for the uh, detector was an, a substance called galena, lead sulfate, which is a semiconductor. So this was the very first instance of the use of a semiconductor for scientific purposes. And the legendary Nobel laureate Sir Neville Mott mentioned in 1970s that J.C. Bowles had most probably anticipated the existence of the P-type and N-type semiconductors. And he certainly was at least 60 years ahead of his times in the use of semiconducting devices. From 1902 to 1933, so the major part of his scientific life, J.C. Bose went past over to the study of response phenomena in plants, complexity of whose response lie intermediate between those of inorganic matter and of animals. Okay. So this is essentially the transition, or rather to try and elucidate the similarity between the animate and the inanimate world, which he called the living and the non-living. Next, please. This is a picture of Jesse Bose painted by Gagonendranath Thakur, a cousin of Rabindranath. And this is essentially the inspired, uh, this picture is very similar to that of Newton, which is called the revealer. 
Okay. This is uh, the same kind of uh, picture where Newton was painted as show, uh, analyzing white light through a prism and seeing the spectrum. In the same vein, J.C. Bose is painted here at illuminating the nature of electromagnetic waves. Next, please. Yeah, so 1902 to 1933, Jesse Bose devotes most of the time and energy in studying the biophysical aspects of living, namely plant systems, and his views run contrary to the beliefs of the times. Okay. Even those who were prevalent until very recently, and as it is an example for all of us, the great reputation that J.C. Bose had built up during the period 1894 to 1899 or 1900 through his demonstration of uh, wireless transmission of signals, it immediately crashed. Okay? He was thought by the Western uh, uh, scientists, a charlatan. He was denounced as an Eastern yogi who is not given to proper scientific rigor. Okay. And in fact, all of that, his reputation came under cloud. Papers that he had written okay, were withdrawn even after scrutiny. Okay. And uh, the Journal of the Royal Society refused publication to him. Okay. And J.C. Bose's tenacity, he did not uh, fret or uh, uh, despair, but he resolved to meet the objections and the arguments through demonstration of rigor and scientific proof. Next, please. In the process, he de uh, designed and developed a large number of extremely sensitive equipments through which many of the biological processes could be quantitatively measured measured to a degree beyond imagination at the time. Okay. So in that sense, J.C. Bose was is really the father of modern quantitative biological study using physical means. Next, please. The well, please go, uh, keep going through them. Many of these uh, show equipments of extremely high sensitivity and sophistication. And note again, as I already mentioned, that they were all designed by him and developed by him. Next, please. So this is truly a demonstration of the proper quantitative foundation of biology. Okay. Next. 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 This is a picture of Rabindranath Tagore, uh, the first Asian Nobel laureate and India's greatest poet and humanist. He also had a tremendous bonhomie and friendship with J.C. Bose. They were almost contemporaries, just two and a half years apart in age. And they were probably two of the most kindred souls. Next. This is a picture, a facsimile of a letter J.C. Uh, Rabindranath had written to Lady Obola. And in this, he describes his efforts. I had mentioned already that during 1900 and 1902, 
1901, J.C. Bowes wanted to stay on in England and finish some of the work, but the government of India, namely the Education Service of Bengal, had denied him uh, leave with pay. So Rabindranath had to go around and use his contacts in various princely states, namely that of Tripura, the Maharaja of Tripura, to generate garner support for J.C. Bose to continue to stay in England and finish his work. So this letter shows how seriously and how earnestly Rabindranath had been trying to that end. Next. Yeah, this is uh, a letter to a certain Mrs. Wilson okay, uh, by J.C. Bose. And this was a year before Bose Institute was founded. Okay. But the, the preparation for the creation of Bose Institute was in full swing at the time. And what he writes is, my dear Mrs. Wilson, the Bose Institute will also be beautiful architecturally. As you enter, there is a large stone lotus on the left. That is the basis, basin in which water lilies will grow. Just overlooking this well will be a bar relief of a woman with prayer beads and the lamp in her hand. This institute is the embodiment of her prayer, Sister Nivedita. Next, please. Yes, the Bharadeev. Next. Next. Yeah. Contributions of Sister Nivedita to Bose Institute is something which I already alluded to. Uh, during her voyage through India to the various places of important uh, uh, religious and social uh, uh, relevance, Nivedita had sketched many things. This is the cave of Ajanta. Next. after which the main door of Bose Institute has been fashioned. Next. The Ajanta Caves, okay, next. Were sketched by Nivedita and when designing Bose Institute, as Jesse Bose wrote to Mrs. Wilson, all of these were taken into account, next. This is a picture of Bose Institute now. Next. This is the facade of Bose Institute's interior view. Next. And most relevantly, this is Nivedita's sketch of the thunder, the Vajra of the Dichi fame. Okay. And next. This has been embodied in the emblem of Bose Institute. Bose Institute's logo is the Bajro, the thunder, which is nothing but a symbol of superb sacrifice. Next. The sun, uh, the, uh, in the lecture hall of Bose Institute, this mural, this uh, ceiling, is a depiction of the sun god. Next. This again is a letter uh, to Ms. Helbert. Uh, just a month before J.C. Bose died, eulogizing Sister Nivedita, that she was also greatly interested in the revival of all intellectual advances made in India. And it was her strong belief in the advance of modern science accomplished by 
Indian men of science that led me to found my research institute, Bose Institute. Next, please. Yeah, uh, we have been talking for close to an hour now. So let me just take five or 10 more minutes to uh, sum up JC Bose's uh, legacy and the lessons that he has left for us. Legacy means inheritance, heritage, tradition, or something that we receive from the predecessors. Next. And legacy includes achievements, contributions, the personality, character, spirit, disposition, and message. So what do we have as legacy from JC Bowes? Next. The personality of Jesse Bose. Well, he was a scientist of rare talent, as can be seen. In fact, Einstein had once said famously that if monuments were to be erected for scientific discoveries, then Jesse Bose should have at least six monuments erected in his memory. J.C. Bose's philosophic vision, his belief in the universality of science, his belief in the role of science for the good of entire mankind, his literary imagination, his prose is really beautiful. And in fact, I should mention that the speech that he gave, the inaugural address on the day of foundation of Post Institute, his uh, birthday, 30th November in 1917, it's uh, available as a document called The Voice of Life. And this is, in my opinion, a must read for every liter literate Indian. Such beautiful prose and such intense passion is something which is rare in even the most classic pieces of writing. Nationalist seer, of course. Reasoned emotion, which will become clear in just a few uh, slides later. Passionate nationalist and a humane person. Okay. Next. And his uh, legacy, domination over adversity. I already gave you the example that when he was facing opposition from the entire scientific community, even people who had adored him just a few uh, years ago, short years ago, he did not lose faith. He persevered and ultimately carried the day. Okay. Scientific originality, discovering truth. I think I have given you enough examples today to convince you of that. Aesthetics as foundation of creativity. This is something which we will come to in a minute. And faith in India's tradition and future. Next. Next. His extor exhortation to the students of Presidency College is that, but it came to me as a flash that it was not for the man to quarrel with circumstances, but bravely to accept, to confront, and dominate over them. And we belong to a race which had accomplished great things with simple means. I already mentioned to you his design of very sophisticated novel equipments and get them made by the local artisans, many of which continue to be unparalleled in accuracy and novelty. Next.
Yes, a continuation of the same. Okay. I accepted the challenge and got the severe punishment. Still, I persisted and ultimately won victory through determination never to yield against odds. Here he is narrating one experience where he was asked to fight the champion boxer at school, even though he had no previous uh, experience in doing so. Okay. However, great. This attitude helped me in my later intellectual counter. Next. The convocation address in Patna University, he summarized that nothing is impossible if we put our whole mind to it and pursue it with unwavering determination. Distrust acts as a blight. It is by optimism that we radiate hope and strength. Pessimism and cynicism are not only part, are not only vulgar, but they are signs of decadence. Next. Next. J.C. Bose died in 1937, November, and in his memory, the J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture was instituted the year after, which is held on his birthday, 30th November, on which day Bose Institute celebrates its foundation day. And the first lecture, first J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture, was delivered by his lifelong friend, Rabindranath Tagore. Nothing could be more apt. And in that lecture, Rabindranath says that at that moment, he is talking about the moment when J.C. Bose was passing over uh, in his studies of electrical response from the living to the non-living. At that moment, his mind seemed entranced with a vision of the living creatures, fundamental kinship with the world of the unconscious. He was busy in employing his marvelous inventiveness in coaxing mute nature to yield her hidden language. The response that he received to skillful questioning revealed to him glimpses of the mystery of an existence that concealed in meaning underneath a contradiction of its appearance. Next. In 1911, J.C. Bose gave a speech in Mayaman Singh, then in India, but now in Bangladesh, on the difficulties of research in India, which later served as his motivation, uh, well, not later, but which was one of, at the core of his determination to uh, found Bose Institute. He said that it is true that here we suffer from many difficulties, but how does it help us to envy the good fortune of others? Rise from your depression, cast off your weakness. Let us think. Next. We often forget that the real laboratory is one's own mind. The room and the instruments only externalize that. Every experiment has first to be carried out in the inner region. To keep the mental vision clear, great struggles have to be undergone. Next. The enquirer must follow where he is led, holding the quiet faith the things which appear today to be of no use may be of highest interest tomorrow. It is necessary then that the enquirer and his disciples should work on ceaselessly, undeterred by years of failure, and undistracted by the thunder of public applause. Lessons which more than a hundred years later we should remind ourselves of. The enquirer must follow. Next, please. The inaugural address at BHU, which was alluded to a little at the beginning of this session today, 
My first work in the region of invisible lights made me fully realize how in the midst of a luminous ocean, we stood almost blind. But out of his senses, man has dared in science to build for himself a raft of thought by which to make daring adventures into the great seas of the unknown. I don't know of any better words to philosophize, to put and articulate the philosophy of true scientific pursuit. Next. But there are other truths which will remain beyond the beyond even the super sensitive methods known to science. For these we require faith, tested not in a few years, but by an entire life. And this, to me, is an extremely important statement. This faith is not by fiat, not by just a few years experience, but this is a realization through experience, uh, of an entire lifetime and beyond. In fact, this lesson that is the experience of truth that is achieved is a fruit of the society that must be passed on from generation to generation. Next, please. Next. Tagore had written to, uh, had talked about Jesse Bose, that although science has been your first love, the goddess of literature could claim the same regard from you had you not been con consciously indifferent to her. Jesse Bose's uh, penchant with beautiful prose, I think you have already got some inkling of. It's also known that he was equally fluent in Bengali. And in fact, before the language of Bengali got its mellifluousness at the hands of Tagore, Jesse was wrote extremely fluent and beautiful prose, which attests to his great literary flair. Next. But his love of aesthetics is also translated into literature. At this uh, inaugural address as that I mentioned a little while ago, he mentioned that in this institute, the study and garden of life, the claim of art has not been forgotten. For the artist has been working with us from foundation to pinnacle and from floor to ceiling of this very hall. I showed you a picture of the ceiling of the lecture hall uh, where this uh, inaugural address was delivered. Next. And beyond the arch, the laboratory merges imperceptibly into the garden, which is the true laboratory for the study of life. There the creepers, the plants and trees are played upon by natural environment, sunlight and wind and where they will be subjected to chromatic action of different lights, to invisible rays, to electrified ground or thunder charged atmosphere. Next. The faith in Indian's tradition and future. <coughs> Next, please. Notice how relevant these uh, continue to be even 100 years later. And in this country through millenniums, there always have been some who beyond the intermediate and absorbing prize of the hour sought for the realization of the highest ideal of life, not through passive renunciation, but through active struggle. Next. We can however claim with full justification the existence of ancient school pursuing exact experimental methods in their investigations. There can be no doubt that they had a clear conception of various bodily functions, often in the advance of contemporary knowledge. 
The marvelous technique they elaborated bespeaks their natural patient pursuit of the experimental method. And in this context, I should mention that if never, according to Neville Mott, J.C. Bose's discoveries in electromagnetism was 50 to 60 years ahead, his work in uh, plant uh, sciences and electrophysiology and physical methods applied to biological studies was more than a century ahead of its time. On his 150th birth anniversary in uh, 2008, there was a symposium, one day symposium, international symposium held at Christ College, Cambridge, where he was an undergraduate student. And the consensus emerged from that uh, symposium that J.C. Bose's work in the area of plant intelligence, plant consciousness, and electrophysiology in general, or biophysics, experimental biophysics in general, was a century ahead of its time. Okay, next. With this widened outlook, we shall not only maintain the highest tradition of the past, but also serve the world in nobler ways. We shall be at once with it in feeling the common surging of life, the common love for the good, the true, and the beautiful. Next. India is drawn into the vortex of international competition. How true. She has to become efficient in every way, through spread of education, through performance of civic duties and responsibilities, through activities, both industrial and commercial. Neglect of these essentials of national duty will imperil her very existence. Next. And in his speech to the students of Presidency College, he said, our motto should be that we sow, though you may not uh, reap the fruit. And lastly, he ended, next please. He ended his inaugural address with this sentence, which remains, continues to be my inspiration even at this, uh, these afternoon years of my life. We stop here today and begin our work tomorrow so that through our united efforts, we can bring about the greater India yet to be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Raha, for walking us through the life, the work, and times of Acharya Jagdish Chandra Basu. And as you have very beautifully given a picture of how he was ahead, perhaps half a century ahead in terms of research in semiconductor physics, and almost a century ahead when it came to plant neurobiology. Um, if there are any questions, I request our audience to type them in the YouTube channel. But taking the privilege of coordinating this question answer session, let me begin by asking a few questions from my own side. Um, even though he was denounced by the, the then scientists when he had dwelled into the plant neurobiology, or what we call today as plant neurobiology, but the electrical impulses study uh, when what he had carried out. But as late as even 1999 or even 2008, where we have the critics of J.C. Bose like Subroto Das Gupta, and if I, if I may quote him, that it was his Jagdish Chandra Bose's approach was not rationalistic. And if I have to exactly quote his words, it's like uh, analogical insight was everything and thus the test of critical scrutiny was superfluous. 
I would yes. like I request your comment, your your analysis of this kind of a critique of Acharya Basu. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this kind of criticism is uh, not foreign to most scientists who tend to uh, try or uh, want to go against the uh, wave, the prevailing wave of the standard norm. Uh, this is uh, entirely to be expected. But in hindsight, what we do know is that J.C. Bose's views of the processes was still somewhat limited. Looking at, uh, you have to look at the situation in a bit of a historical, uh, uh, with a <clears throat> historical hindsight. And that is, this was essentially in the early stages of the 1900s and the, certainly the first uh, quarter of the 20th century, during which time the biological sciences was in itself facing a sort of crisis of existence. Quantitative biology was still not the norm. And the practitioners held on to the empirical observations. Empirical, or I would call it uh, essentially, well, no, empirical is the word, empirical uh, analysis. So J.C. Bowes came at them with very different kind of information which they did not know how to process or absorb. Secondly, biologists at that time used to think of their domain as totally independent of the physical sciences or the natural sciences. The microscopic nature of the measurements which J.C. Bose was advocating was entirely foreign to them. Most of the problems of plant, uh, the claims of uh, against J.C. Bose's claim of plant recognition or so-called plant intelligence were primarily on the basis of electrical responses. Jezebus himself had totally ignored the role of chemical processes in biology. And if you look at his uh, history of sci his scientific uh, history and annals, he lived during a time when quantum mechanics, the greatest revolution of the 20th century, other than relativity, of course, was developing, evolving, and almost everybody was taken by the storm. J.C. Bose, during his entire career, kept totally aloof about it. He never recognized the role of quantum mechanics. He never realized the atomic theory. To him, that electrons are actually the source of electricity was something which he never wrote about anywhere. So his attitude towards this was primarily on the basis of the classical idea of current. Okay. And in his writings, he never ever tried to make an connection with the modern way of thinking, which may have set him at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the other practitioners of the time. Now, Supratha Das Gupta's thing is primarily that was the prevalent area okay, of that time. Even today, even if there is 
a large number of uh, adherents to the school who propose that plant intelligence is a viable uh, aspect, but it's not ascribed to the kind of processes that J.C. Bose thought was necessary. So to be fair to him, it's my opinion that his observations were certainly very correct. They are still unparalleled, they're correct, they are exemplary, but I cannot justify that the interpretation that Jesse Bowles thought of is 100% correct. He made extremely right and sensitive measurements, but he start, tried to explain them, or in, at times he didn't even explain them. He just made the observations. And because there was no explanation available within the known sphere at the time, people thought that he was either not being careful or he was not uh, being scientific in his approach. Thank Does you very much. Your question? Yeah, yeah, of course it answers. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, your opinion about the mm -hmm. If there are no further questions, and you do also want of time, uh, Dr. Ramanathan, Dr. Ramanathan, uh, yeah. like uh, I have a, short, a very small question, uh, Professor Raha. Like as I can see, the audience in uh, that was listening to you are mostly college students and school students, and yes. many a times we have read that uh, there is a fight between Marconi and J.C. Bose for the wireless and the radio waves. So mm -hmm. for the benefit of these young students, can we in a very, you know, uh, very easy language explain whether there is a difference between the inventions of Marconi and Bose or it has been copied because as we know that the controversy and the IEEE just recognized like 15 years back the work of J.C. Bose. So in a simple terms, if we wish to explain it to the students, what was J.C. Bose's work and what was Marconi's work and what was whether it was same or not. So we would like to have an input from you for this. Mm. Yes, sir. No, no, no. Effectively, they are different works. Uh, as I uh, tried to explain through this anecdote that I alluded to, Marconi's success was greatly aided by the use of his horn antenna, which J.C. Bose had designed. Okay. But Marconi essentially worked with long waves called the radio waves, whereas J.C. Bose transmitted his signals through very small waves, microwaves. Okay. Uh, the methodology involved in these two propagations are substantially different. The long waves, the radio waves, get reflected and they have very long ranges. And they are long ranges because they essentially get reflected in the ionosphere. Okay. Whereas the microwaves are very important in line of sight measurements, line of sight communication. So they can go through the uh, uh, barriers very effectively. The use of microwaves found its true application during the Second World War in the development of radar. Whereas trans uh, bound, boundary, transcontinental uh, communication through radio waves was Marconi's work. The point of similarity between them two was essentially, as I mentioned, in the uh, design of the detectors, the design of the receivers. And that's where J.C. Bose's work was substantial and helped Marconi in developing his methods. But otherwise, Marconi's work was not really science as such. It was primarily an engineering feat. Whereas Jesse Bose's work was largely science, try to understand 
the basic of basis of wireless transmission. Okay. Thank you, Professor Raha. And uh, I'm sure there may be a lot of more curious questions, but if for want of time, I am forced to wrap the session. But before we wrap, I have the pleasure of inviting Professor Dinesh Kumar, the Vice Chancellor of J.C. Bose University of Science and Technology, Faridabad, who has uh, patiently presided over this lecture. I now request him to give his presidential remarks. Professor Dinesh Kumar. Thank you very much. Dear Professor Sivaji Raha, former director Basu Vigyan Mandir, Bose Institute, Maniya Jayantaji Sesbuddhe, Rashtri Sanction Sachi, Vibha, dear Dr. Ramanathan, Dr. Rajiv Singh, distinguished participants from various strata of the society, from university, from colleges, and dear Vibha members. First of all, I would like to congratulate Vibha for organizing such a wonderful talk where Professor Sivaji Raha spoke about life and works of J.C. Bose in a such a uh, elaborate way that most of us have understood how J.C. Bose worked throughout his life in those difficult times when it was very difficult, when it was not easy to get small, small experiments, apparatus, uh, uh, apparatus, uh, you know, uh, it was not easy to assemble. It was not easy to procure from outside. But J.C. Bose truly, as uh, Professor Raha mentioned, he, he could demonstrate, he could conduct his experiments using very simple experiments, very simple apparatus made actually locally through artisans from Calcutta. I think this is very important part. We should remember that science can be done uh, without actually very sophisticated experiments, even with simple experiments, it can be done. It was really at that time, it was not less than last Bhakti because all of us know that at those times, India was not getting access to these kind of equipment. And it is really, uh, we are happy that a person like Jagdish Chandra Bose uh, is like a role model now and uh, for our youngsters and for now our next generation, young students, we should also think like this, that mind is laboratory, true laboratory is mind. If you have a mind, then you don't have to do very sophisticated experiments. So this Raha Sahib has told us very well today for the benefit of our students and I'm sure that our young students sometimes say that we don't have equipment, we don't have experiment, we don't have sophisticated equipment. उन सब को आज ये सोचना चाहिए कि जेसी बोस जैसे वैज्ञानिक ने किस तरीके से उस डिफिकल्ट टाइम में काम किया ये बहुत जरूरी चीज है हमारे लिए दूसरा इनफैक्ट जो आजादी के महोत्सव के लिए जो 75 साल जो पूरे हुए हैं उसमें हम अपने जो आजादी में जिसने पार्टिसिपेट किया कंट्रीब्यूट किया उन सभी के बारे में आज चर्चा कर रहे हैं मुझे बड़ी खुशी है दैट विभा हैज कंडक्टेड ए लेक्चर जिन्होंने शायद आजादी में अपना इंपॉर्टेंट रोल प्ले किया ऑल ऑफ अस नो कि जब अरहा साहब बता रहे थे कि तीन साल उन्होंने बिना सैलरी के काम किया और बिना सैलरी के अपना अपना जो अंदर की एंगुस है वो दिखाया कि भाई आप दो तरह की सैलरी कैसे दे सकते हैं हमारे प्रोफेसर्स को एक यूरोपियन को अलग और इंडियंस को अलग तो उन्होंने बड़े नॉन वायरलेस ढंग से अपनी रिजेंटमेंट शो किया और तीन साल तक बिना सैलरी के काम करने से ये ऐसे लगता है कि उस समय आजादी के जो आजादी जिस वजह से हमें मिली उसमें इन इन जैसे वैज्ञानिकों का जैसे इन इन सारे इंसिडेंट से पता चलता है कि इट इज रियली ट्रूली राष्ट्र भक्ति और देश भक्ति आई एम वेरी हैप्पी कि मैं तो इनफैक्ट आज जब रहा साहब वाज टेलिंग अबाउट सर जगदीश चंद्र बसु के बारे में बता रहे थे स्पेशली हिज एजुकेशन केम्ब्रिज मैं एक ऑलमोस्ट एक तरह से आई वॉज you know, traveling through the time because uh, I happened to be uh, in Cambridge for five years and uh, I have visited the Christ College. I have seen uh, this um, Cavendish lab where Neville Mote, Sir Neville Mote was also there. So when Rahasa was mentioning about uh, 
Neville Moore's uh, uh, kind of uh, remarks about Sir J.C. Bose. It was truly, you know, uh, it was uh, fascinating and it was like very, uh, it was giving good feeling. So I'm very happy that uh, uh, Vibha has organized such a nice lecture on J.C. Bose. And I happen to be from a university uh, whose name uh, is also after J.C. Bose. In fact, I think that India has J.C. Bose's name in the institute in Calcutta, where they are from Rahsaab. और शायद दूसरी एक तरह के ऐसे इंस्टीट्यूट जो यूनिवर्सिटी है वो शायद हमारे फरीदाबाद में है मुझको ज्यादा नहीं मालूम आई मे बी रॉन्ग बट आई एम वेरी हैप्पी दैट ऐसे वैज्ञानिक के पीछे जिन्होंने अपनी पूरी लाइफ इस तरह से इंटरडिसिप्लिनरी रिसर्च में लगाई एक वैज्ञानिक ऐसा हो सकता है कि लाइफ में बॉटनी में भी काम करे और फिजिक्स में भी काम करे और एक्सीलेंट काम करे लेकिन आजकल हम देखते हैं कभी-कभी हम छोटे-छोटे एक अपने स्पेशलाइजेशन के ऊपर ही काम करते रहते हैं सारी जिंदगी भर हम उससे आगे बाहर नहीं निकलते और उस समय के लोगों की आप सोच देखिए सर जगदीश चंद्र बोस जैसे वैज्ञानिक यदि उस समय हमारे देश में जब हमारे पास कोई फैसिलिटीज नहीं होती थी तब हो सकते हैं तो आज हम हमारे पास जब बहुत सारी फैसिलिटीज अवेलेबल हैं हमारा नया भारत आ गया है तो हमारे जो नए जो हमारे स्टूडेंट्स हैं नई जनरेशन है तो मेरे को लगता है उनके मन में जरूर एक ऐसी भावना पैदा होनी चाहिए कि ऐसे वैज्ञानिकों का जो काम और मेहनत को देखते हुए हमें भी आगे उसी तरह से काम करके उनसे ज्यादा अच्छा काम करना चाहिए तो इन शब्दों के साथ मैं रहा साहब का बहुत धन्यवाद करता हूँ बहुत आई एक्सप्रेस माई सिंसियर थैंक्स की उन्होंने ही एक्सप्लेन इन डिटेल एग्जैक्टली एवरी फ्रॉम ए टू जेड About Sir Jagdish Chandra Bose, I mean, so I will request him sometime that to visit our Faridabad University sometime in Faridabad J C Bose University. If he can give a lecture to our students and our faculty members like this, they will all be will always they will all be motivated by his lecture. I know when uh, our university name was being converted from Y M C A University to J C Bose University, which happened only two three years back, only two years back, there was a lot of resentment among the minds of. Our uh, uh, students, they all, they all thought that what happened? That our university's name is the name of the YMC from JC Bose. But I think that when Raha Sahib has told me that JC Bose, like a scientist, has worked in which way, 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 in non-violent and in which way, 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 कि YMCA से तो कोई मतलब भी नहीं बनता एक जेसी बोस एक ऐसे वैज्ञानिक के पीछे हमारी यूनिवर्सिटी का नाम हुआ है ये सारी चीजें बहुत आसानी से समझ में आएंगी और मेरी राह साहब से निवेदन रहेगा कि जैसे ये नॉर्मल लाइफ हो जाए ऑलमोस्ट हो रही है पर जैसे ही महीने दो महीने में नॉर्मल लाइफ हो जाए आई रिक्वेस्ट हिम टू विजिट टू माई यूनिवर्सिटी एंड गिव ए लेक्चर लाइक दिस टू माई ऑल स्टूडेंट एंड फैकल्टी में वेरी हैप्पी स्पेशली आई एम थैंकफुल टू विभा एंड ऑल ऑर्गेनाइजर्स ऑफ दिस प्रोग्राम Um, that they have invited me and given me this opportunity to preside over this uh, particular lecture. I'm very happy. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, Professor Dinesh Kumar, for your beautiful presidential remark. And with that, we come to a close of uh, today's lecture. And decorum demands that I express my formal vote of thanks uh, once again to the speaker, Professor Shivaji Raha, who had taken his time. in order to share his experience his thoughts that he had invested in the life and works of acharya jagdish chandra basu thank you very much sir for your time and your lecture i also thank professor dinesh kumar who patiently presided over this lecture and also gave his presidential remark last but not the least i thank all the audience who joined us through a different social media platform be it youtube or facebook uh the next lecture the eighth lecture in this series of swatantrata sangram or vigyan we have dr mridula ramanna who will be speaking to us the next week the next lecture on the title doctors public health challenges political and political issues in colonial bombay so you are invited for that lecture and finally before concluding i would like to conclude this session by the words of acharya jagdish chandra basu and i quote it was then that i understood for the first time a little of that message proclaimed by my ancestors on the banks of ganga 30 years ago 30 centuries ago they who see but one in all the changing manifoldness of the universe unto them belongs the eternal truth unto none else unto none else unquote thank you one and all jai hind namaste